Hello, my name is David Lister. I'm with Moriel Ministries. I've been wanting to do a, a video on evangelism. My friend Marco has wanted me to do this sometime or maybe even a series of them. So I would wanted to start elsewhere, but we're going to start with this one today on how we evangelize those in cults and other religions. Um, uh, first off, all evangelism starts with prayer and love. You cannot evangelize without praying for the people and, and loving them and asking God to give you love for the person that you want to talk to or even the people group that you want to talk to about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's many ways that we uh, can approach people we have to make sure that uh, other things is that we be very patient when witnessing. We just don't give people the gospel and then all of a sudden that's it. Um, there's other things that we have to do and um, we have to sometimes pull away the false teachings they're believing or they're in error to help clear this up. Uh, in some cases, we actually have to pull the mask off of the false Christ they have. So with family members, it's great patience, not just patience, it's great patience. And we look for the right time. And then also one of the great tools is listening. If you listen to people and ask questions, they will often tell you what's in their heart, out of the heart the mouth speaks. And so it's real important that you listen and and you have to care for the person, too, and they have to understand that you do care for them. But we'll go over that in other videos, God willing. But today, um, I want to start with Mormons. I, uh, I've been witnessing to Mormons as a group and individually for over 30-plus uh, years. And I uh, use a technique that many thousands of people use across the world to witness to them. I was trained on this. Uh, people like Tim Oliver and also uh, uh, Gerald and Sandra Tanner. In fact, Sandra Tanner invited me to come out to Utah the first time. So everybody I've met out there that are full-time Mormon evangelists, well, this is some of the techniques they do. Um, uh, there's this one place in Utah called Manti where they used to have a big pageant and tens of thousands of Mormons would come there every year. And a lot of Christians would come down there and the fishing was good. They could speak to a lot of Mormons. But one this one particular year, we had a worldwide uh, famous evangelist come down and he came in there and he plopped his little platform down and he climbed on it and he preached a great gospel message. It would have been great in my church. I, in fact, I, I enjoyed the message. But when he was finished, he picked up his platform and left. Now, the thing is, I then and my other friends started turning to Mormons. And the first thing the Mormon said is, well, there's your great evangelist. We believe what you believe. We believe that we're saved by faith through grace and believe in Jesus. And so that's when this technique comes of having to understand when they use Christian terms, what they're actually saying. For instance, in Mormonism, grace is something you get after all you can do. For instance, <clears throat> and that's a quote from their teaching, after all you can do. And what is that all you can do? You must reach a state in this life a state of perfection where even the desire urge to sin has been burned out of you, according to Spencer Kimball, and then you get the grace. Well, when you ask them, well, how are you doing? They generally would say, well, we have repentance to help us here. So, well, repentance and Mormonism is a true repentance is a one-time event. For instance, if you lie and then you repent of lying, what happens is you go along for 10 years and you don't lie. Well, that would, and then you start lying again. Well, that was a false repentance back then. And then their, their scriptures teach them to the soul that sins and sins again, 
this you may know uh, his former sins come back upon him. Okay, and when and repentance to them is um, this may you may know that a person repents when he forsakes his sin. In other words, if you're on a sinking ship, you forsake the ship. You don't go back, but it's a one-time event. So grace is different. Repentance is different. But then their Jesus is different too. The Jesus of Mormonism is the spirit brother uh, of Lucifer. His father, Jehovah, came to this planet in the form of a man had physical sex with the Virgin Mary so that no other man would do it. And then Jesus, in obedience to Father, did everything right according to the Father and then became a God. Well, um, the thing is, is, is that now that's your task because you have to do everything, live, live a sinless life or reach a, since we've all sinned, what you have to do is reach, a, again, a state of perfection where you don't sin ever and remain until the end of your life. Sounds pretty daunting. But what we do is we take their own teachings and show that they're actually under the law. They're trying to earn their way in and that their grace is not true grace. And so we allow the weight of the law to become their teacher that they realize eventually they're not seen. And then we also, as we're doing this, we're showing them that the Jesus they have is different than the Jesus of the Bible, that the devil has put a mask on on Jesus, as it were. Um, he's really a different Jesus, the Second Corinthians 11 says. And so we pull that mask off and point them people and point people to the Bible, to his truth in the Bible, as well as to the true Jesus. So this is some of the techniques. It takes a bit to learn. It's uh, not extremely hard, but you can learn to do this, and it and you can lead people out. Many Mormons, there's plenty of churches in Utah full of ex-Mormons by, by missionaries that did this exact same thing. Now, I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We have a lot of Roman Catholics here, a lot. In fact, the, the largest reliquary outside of the Vatican is less than two miles from my house. It's, uh, uh, it's anyway, St. Michael's. But the fishing here is good because there's lots of Catholics wherever you go. And I, I keep a uh, catechism in my glove compartment so that when I run into them, I, I like to show just like I show the Mormons their Book of Mormons, their doctrines and covenants and their own teachings, most, many of what I have in my head, but I show them their catechism. And, and they go, well, I don't believe that. And you show them something else, well, I don't believe that. I said, well, you know, you're, it, the problem is, is that if you don't believe it, it's a mortal sin. Now, my friend Mike Gendron showed me, he called the Jesus of, of Roman Catholicism, an insufficient Jesus. Their Jesus is Jesus plus your baptism, plus your confirmation, plus uh, masses, plus confession. Jesus plus, 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 plus. And he likes to get them to the real Jesus that is by grace you were saved through faith. And you take away all these other things and he asks the question, are you ready for Jesus without all this other? And so, and so it's a very good te technique of using their own documents to show the errors so that we can reveal the true Jesus again, minus the mask that the devil hides them in. We, we take away, the, we expose the different Jesus, as it were. And then finally, uh, a, another section I'd like to talk about is when I witness to Jews. Well, with Jews, there's a big controversy right now about the Metatron. People are actually attacking this technique, saying it's a uh, slippery slope and problematic. Well, this technique has been around... Jews for Jesus has an article up on our website that you can 
on their website, but as we've posted it, reposted it, that, that shows people were teaching this from the 1600s. Uh, at the end of this, I have a, um, a PDF from 1863, which we'll put up or link to, that uses uh, the title, The Great Mystery, How Three Could Be One, which, which is a great mystery to Jews. And, and so that comes um, from 1863, but there was also a re redone in 1970, which Jacob put that book up for you. I believe my copy is 1874, the same book, just updated. But there's others that use this technique of exposing the Metatron as a different Jesus. And so how do we how do we go through their own false teaching, the occultic teachings, the Kabbalah, the Zohar? How do we use these items to pull away the mask? Well, when you read their teachings, it says some very interesting things. Now, in the Talmud, Metatron is identified as the angel who went before the Israelites in the wilderness and the angels whose voice was to be obeyed, the angel who had authority to pardon transgressions because Yahweh's name within him. The Talmud refers to the Metatron as the angel whose name is the same as his master. Now, if you ask a Christian, who is this angel that had authority to pardon um, Pardon transgressions. Who is this angel whose voice was to be obeyed? Who is this angel is the same as the masters? Well, Christians would say that was Jesus. Now, because the Metatron seems to be divine, the Talmud, which again is man's opinion, and we don't agree with it and everything, but we are using it to, again, expose the different Jesus. And the, the Talmud asks the question uh, concerning... Uh, Oh, I'll, just, I'll just read it here. Are then two powers? Some say Christians believe in Yeshua's deity, believe in two gods, two Yahweh's. No more so than Jews do. Consider the fallen taken from the teachings of Rabbi Joseph Sovetichek, who was the unchallenged leader of an enlightened orthodoxy, Judaism in the 20th century. Commenting on Exodus 34, 6, this rabbi said, The Lord, the Lord. Why does it say the Lord twice? I am he who is there before man sin, and I am he who is there after man sins and repent. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God, Isaiah 59, 2. The end result of sinning is the driving out, as it were, from the holy present. But who then will take care of the sinner after the holy one removes himself and the sinner is left alone? Who will help? him to cut himself off from his sins and escape from their contamination? Who will lead him back home to the heavenly father? Who will extend a helping hand to rescue him from the quicksand in which he is sunk? Thou hast extended a hand to sinners and thy right hand stretches forth to receive the penitent. Who is it that extends the hand to the sinner and stretches forth his right arm to receive these penitents. The Lord, the Lord, two times the infallible name is mentioned. The first removes himself from the sinner and bans him, but the second, the Lord, who is there after man's sin remains. The second holy name is ready to listen, even after the first has shut the gates of glory through which man passes to stand before his maker. Well, Christians would all say, we know who the arm of the Lord is. We know who the right hand is, the right hand to help. Okay, and so that was a discussion between Orthodox Jewish sources, which we can put these up on the website, you know. And so there's there's many other discussions discussions on, on this topic. Now, um, before I even met Jacob, I had understands some of this and how to do this. In fact, I got some of my early learning from Dr. Michael Brown. Now, I do not do, uh, endorse Dr. Michael Brown because he was the apologist for the Brownsville revival, and I interviewed him in 96 and told him what he was wrong. 
but also he's now involved with the NAR prophets and false prophets and false apostles. But anyway, in his book, Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus, uh, Volume 2, Theological Explanations, is, you know, he talks about this Metatron. He talks about this Metatron who was called Yahweh. Okay? And so he talks about the Talmudic uh, interpretation of this Metatron word. And so he goes on even further um, uh, in another person. There's, there's more and more. You can go on and on. Jews for Jesus has posted a great article that, uh, that I didn't even know about that goes back to the 1600s of using these techniques. So not only is uh, of, of taking error and helping to remove the different Jesus from them so that they can see Jesus. They actually say, again, Metatron is a divine name. You know, his name is Yahweh. So for Jews, they're partially blind. Okay, they can't quite see. They rejected their Messiah and everything. And so the thing for us is as we try to try to remove the mask of the false Jesus, we, um, it takes time, it takes patience, and it takes love, and we use these things. And, and so uh, we hope that you will take advantage of those resources that we'll leave for you and everything. But, but I've used these techniques for years, like I said, and I believe that there's lots of people using them. And if I could tell you a couple little stories that I've, um, how I've used this. Once, uh, my last time I was in the land in Israel, I had two friends meet me and the um, first time there, and we were going to a buffet. And in the, at this buffet, at this big hotel full of Jews, it was at Booth's. And what happened is, is that the, as we were in line waiting, it's very crowded, the little hostess was asking the Jewish people to sign or did they want her to sign? And because that's considered work, all the Jews would ask this, this other Jewish girl to sign for them. And so when I got up there, I said a little bit loud, can I ask you a question? After she asked me, should I sign or do you want to sign? And I asked her, well, is it better that you sin or is it better that I sin? She says, well, of course, better that you sin. And I said, since you asked correctly, I will sign. And so I wanted the people in front of me to hear and the Jewish people in behind me to hear of what they're actually doing. And so we sat down at our table and my friends, right after we got our meals started at the buffet, they, we started asking me questions and the questions were coming, the answers were coming. I really felt the Holy Spirit's present on me, and, and I was giving them the answers of God's love for the Jews and his faithfulness to them. And, and also, pretty soon, two girls sitting next to us leaned over and said, can we ask you a question? And I said, of course you can ask me a question. And so I asked, so I answered their questions. And then some other people asked, turned around and asked me some questions. And of course, I was teaching from the Tanakh and, and from their own texts that they would know. And so they couldn't object, but they were listening. And pretty soon I happened to notice that the whole restaurant was silent as I was speaking and that I, at the buffet, all the restaurant staff had came out and stood next to the buffet and were listening to this. And God's spirit was upon me and I, I couldn't believe it, you know, and it was just a wonderful time. And so towards the end, my waiter came over and he said, can I ask you a question about Zohar? And I said, yeah, I could uh, answer your question. And so he asked me and I said, well, what's important about Zohar is the great mystery. The three and one, how could three be one? I said, if you can understand that question, you can understand the great mysteries. And he said, well, what is it? And I said, I reminded him, you do Passover every year, yes? 
and you take three pieces of matzah and the middle piece is taken out and broken, right? You hide it and then the, the little kids go look for the apple comb and he says, yes, yes. I said, that's a picture of how three could be one and one could be three. And I said, and all your rabbis teach that that middle piece is a picture of the Paschal Lamb. And I said, but your early rabbis said that that was a picture of the Messiah, the flesh of the Messiah. And so I went through it and, and told them about how it was pierced and how it was broken. And I took them back to Isaiah. And I said, you know, in Isaiah 53, he describes your Messiah. And he was pierced and everything. And so I went through all of that. And and it, I'm sure that this was startling for them because it, would, it was quite interesting there. And, and so we have to remember the Jews are partially blind. You, you know, when you look back, the, the, they could see the arm of the Lord power. They didn't see him, but they saw the power from the arm of the Lord of leading them out. And he, the, the Messiah had been hidden for a long time. And uh, finally, Isaiah re reveals this. Like, it's like a railroad track uh, that's been built. The arm of the Lord, the power of it, is you see it and you realize a lot of effort was taken to build that railroad. But you don't see who. Well, it was like that with the arm of the Lord in Exodus. But now, Isaiah is getting ready to reveal the arm of the Lord. And as it says, it says he's bared his arms. It's like, all right, it's time for the, uh, the arm of the Lord to roll up his sleeves and get started and, and that he's coming. And actually when he comes, he says it, it's the Lord. It says it is me. And, and then this is, and since they're partially blind, it's hard for them to see this great divine name, this great person as so powerful and has done all these things when they start hearing the suffering servant and how he was he was going to be despised, rejected. He was going to be shunned. There was nothing attractive about him. And, and you could imagine, wait a minute, he's supposed to be this powerful being and that can do all this and free us. But if you understand, God had taken care of the captivity with, with Cyrus the shepherd, and that was their physical freedom of going back to Israel. But now in those later chapters of Isaiah, he's talking about freeing them from their real problems, from their sins. And that's why he's revealing the Messiah to them. And so Jews get this double image and, and it's hard for them to understand the suffering servant and the mighty king. And, and so when they reject him, this blindness gets on. And so since they're partially blind, we're trying to, the, the devil comes in and, and puts another mask on and another name. And, and so we have to pull this off. So anyway, back to my story. Um, so when I, so I asked him and I finished, I, since the Lord showed me it was time, I told my waiter, look, I need to go. Um, I'd like to get a dessert because I have a meeting the next day. And, um, and I was wondering, and he said, I said, what do you recommend? And the pastry chef who would come out actually said, look, I recommend the chocolate bomb. It was a, a big round ball of cake with chocolate inside and chocolate on top and chocolate in the middle. And I said, yeah, put that on my bill. Well, the, the, the pastry chef says, there is no charge for you. And my waiter came over. And said, I've never seen that. I've never seen that before. He said, that's a $120 item. And I said, thank you. I went over to the staff. I thanked them all. I blessed everybody in the name of their Messiah. And I charged them all with looking at their own Tanakh in Isaiah 53 to, to see and find their name of the Messiah. And so I want them to do this. I, I did, and as I was leaving, I got over to to the little hostess again where I was leaving out. And the little girl came up to me and said, thank you. And that, I mean, it was just a small thank you, but it kind of said to me that she got some of what I was saying about the difference between 
the Judaism that was there and the, the one that I had talked about that loves Israel with an everlasting love. And so I hope that I told all the Jews there they were responsible for do, looking at this and to see and understand this great mystery of three and one and one and three. So I prayed for them, but I use this other times. I remember with an Orthodox Jew once I, I uh, was in uh, his shop. No one was around. I started to, he asked me why I come to Israel. I said, because I want Jewish people to know the name of their Messiah. And he said, no one can know the name of the Messiah. And I said, sure you can and everything. And, and so I did a few, talked to him about some of these things. And I said, will you read your own Tanakh? And I said, and I believe that if you read this section, and believe me, I was praying. Um, I said, if you read this section, I believe you'll know his name. I said, the Roha Kadesh will reveal this to you. And again, praying. So he said, yeah, I'll read it. So he started reading. And then pretty soon he took his head and put it in his hands. And he was looking very intently down on the counter and reading this. And, and pretty soon he... He looked up, he had this fear in his eyes, and I said, it's okay, there's nobody here. Look, you can say it, you know who it is, go ahead, say it, say it, it's all right. And he said, that's Jesus, that's Jesus. And I said, now that you know that, you're responsible and you know the name of your Messiah because your rabbi said that represents the Messiah. And so it was pretty hard for him, but God is faithful. If you can pull the mask off of these different Jesuses, they can see the true Jesus. They can see the truth of God's word. And so these are some of the things you can do. We'll um, put these links again at the end of this video. And also, uh, Please understand, I hope to make more videos and answer your questions. If you want to email me at Moriel David on how to do things or some references outside the ones we have, be glad to handle that for you. Um, but one thing, I have many friends that use these techniques. Mike Gendron, I told you about a uh, Roman Catholic. He's Calvinist. He's a Reformed theology. I, but when him and I go out, that, that doesn't matter. We go out to win people the Lord. I have Reformed friends out in out in uh, in Utah. Doesn't matter. We want people. We don't argue. We want people to know Jesus, and we work to do this. And we use these same techniques to win them to the Lord. We we love the Mormons. We love the Jehovah Witnesses. We love the Catholics. We love Jewish people. And so we do this because of him. But these people that are fighting against this technique, not only are they fighting against what I do and what Jacob does, they're fighting against Jews for Jesus. They're fighting against the Jews that have been doing this, at least as far as I can tell, since the 1600s, probably further back. Um, and then they're also fighting against very many other people that are writing, even guys that got it right for a little while, like Dr. Michael Brown. But the thing is, and the most important thing is, is they're actually fighting against God. And they should be ashamed. And they need to repent of this. And they need to stop this nonsense because people come to the Lord and you're creating a schism where there should be none, as we we should all return to doing what we did when we were young. Turn back to our first love. Get out and wit witness to people with the zeal and using this techniques to take another Jesus and pull the mask off on them and show them the true Jesus is who calls the dead to life. Again, if you have questions, need some answers, write Moriel David at yahoo.com. I'll be glad to help you. And may the Lord bless.
Hello, thanks for staying tuned. Uh, after I finished the video, I sent it around to some of my friends within Moriel and without Moriel to get some input and see if anybody had any thoughts that might be helpful or questions or anything. And so a good friend, uh, a godly man, a very humble man, sent a, uh, a concern about, I mentioned fighting against these techniques. And so I want to try to explain why I made that statement. Well, um, it's a fair question, and it, so I'm going to take it on. Look, when I after I prayed about that, so why do I believe people are fighting against this technique? Well, the I believe the actions of some who oppose this type of specialized witnessing, I believe, are wrongly motivated. In Second Corinthians, I mean in Galatians two, Peter tells us that they acted out of fear for the party of the circumcised. And so I think people say by us doing this, what has happened is they think out of fear that we are going down this road and we believe they believe we are going to mislead Christians. And, and I don't think that's true at all. I mean, as we go along, I hope this becomes clear. Um, Second, there we saw the, the actions of Peter and others caused some to stumble, as it says in verse 14, that Peter's action was an example and it was followed by the Jews. Well, in this case, I hope Christians can grow in their face and rightly handle this type of specialized evangelism and by this lead others to faith in the real Jesus. I see by Resisting this, it's a bit of hypocrisy showing because they themselves should always be ready for an answer, even if it's a Mormon, a Jew, a Buddhist, a JW, or whoever. But I think most people nowadays are not even witnessing just the simple gospel. I mean, when I was a, a young Christian, everybody was witnessing. Now, I don't even think most people, because they haven't been disciples, they're not witnessing is not being taught in the churches how to witness, and they're not being discipled. And because of this, we have a weak church, and we see what's going on in the world today. So another reason, the actions of these resistors and the others, I believe, are hypocritical. In verse 13 of Galatians 2, it says, He wrote that the rest of the Jews, including Barnabas, joined in in hypocrisy. Again, to me, I believe that Many of these people still believe, but they actually ceased witnessing as well as growing even more knowledgeable and able to witness to a multicultural world. And so, I, I, in my opinion, I believe they've simply deviated from daily witnessing and for, again, growing in godly knowledge and wisdom to handle our times and handle the day that the Lord has set us in. And again, these actions of fighting against this ends up being actually a practical denial of the gospel. Paul acted decisively when, when, uh, when it became to her apparent to him that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. And so by resisting this form of evangelism that I talked about in the in the main video, saying it was simply a slippery slope, I don't think they've taken the time to understand what is being done here with people of other cultures and other false religions, trying to get them out of another gospel. And so my major argument is concerned with this deviation, okay? So people have freaked out about this roughly 20-year-old old teaching that was directed at the one that I have transcribed that, that was directed at um, Jews who were in attendance that day. And even at the end of this teaching, Jacob pleads to the Jews that would be listening to it or reading it. And... And so when Jacob says the Metatron is Jesus, Jesus is the Metatron, is, G is Jacob really saying Jesus is the Metatron of Zohar? No, 
that's another Jesus. And, and some of these people have heard Jacob say, this is occultic. This is bad. Zohar, all that's bad. Look, they, they've heard this. They know it. So why are they asking these questions? Why are they resisting? You know, and so, but what is interesting that, that wasn't pointed out is that on the last page of the thing, Jacob goes down 11 points, which he'd covered in the uh, thing. And each one of them are, is backed up by the scriptures that were being discussed by these rabbis that could partially see. We know Jews are partially blind, so they see a lot of truth. And after the temple was destroyed, what happens is that that Jews felt they had lost the keys, and so they tried to find the truth another way. And while they see some things, they give this understanding of this Messiah who they only partly understand. They give him this name, Metatron, the one who dwells at the center of the throne, not behind the throne, at the center of the throne. But they were seen partially right. And so we can start in specialized evangelism there with what they do see. And then we can take them and as we invite them to understand what they do know from their own rabbis, even though ultimately as Zohar and more mysticism is, is added to it, it gets even crazier, you know, and it gets worse. But this is what the devil does. He takes a truth and perverts the truth and puts a mask in front of every Jesus so that people can't see him. And so all Jacob is trying to do is get Jewish people to believe and, and hopefully instruct some Christians to learn how to do this specialized evangelism. And I know lots of people that can do this, but I know a lot that can't. My neighbors who are Christian, every time JWs come down my street, they call me, hey, David, JWs are coming. So I grab my King James Bible marked with all the good parts that they don't understand and grab it and, and out, off we go. But interesting, one thing that at the end of this article that Jacob answers, who is the Metatron? Yeshua ha Mashiach, Jesus the Messiah, the New Testament. Yes, it is what I think, it is what I know. If you don't want to believe me, believe your own rabbis. Again, all 11 of these points here are all things that all these guys would believe about Jesus. They are. It's just that they're trying to say that, G, that Jacob believes in the Metatron that comes out of the Zohar. No, we believe in this one that the Jews have named Metatron is the angel of the Lord, the one at the middle of the throne, the one that in the Shekinah is, the Redeemer, the only one whose name will answer our prayer. All these Christian beliefs that they partially saw. These Jewish beliefs, they partly saw. And so Jacob ends, my dear Jewish friends, if you are reading this, the Metatron is the Messiah. This is the same thing that Isaiah was trying to do to get people to understand the servant in many ways. The servant, they didn't understand who it was. How could this divine being that that was going to rescue them, was going to be pierced, was going to die. Okay, so the Metatron is the Messiah. The Metatron is God who became man. The Metatron is the only one who can give you salvation. The Metatron is the only one who can bring you to the Jerusalem above that your rabbis taught you about. Not Menamides. No, of course not. I mean, we don't say that. We say they're occultic. Jacob says they're occultic. These guys even admit Jacob has said those things. The Metatron is the only one, the only way, the only future you have. Who? My dear Jewish friends, bless, embrace the sun. Blessed are those who take refuge in the Metatron. Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus, 
the Jewish Messiah. It couldn't be any clearer who Jacob and what this teaching is about. It's not problematic. What's problematic is people are not understanding how to witness and how to use his effective tools. And again, they're fighting against Jews for Jesus who use this and who others for 150 years that I know of have discovered these tools and use them. The same type tools I use in Mormon evangelism and Jehovah Witnesses, my what I want to do, what Moriel wants to do, is pull the evil mass that the devil has put on the true Jesus in order to hide him from people. We want to reveal who the true Jesus is and reveal him as the angel Lord, all these things that are on that last page. So if you haven't, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you learned it. And my prayer is that we can get back to witnessing and get back to growing in knowledge. We have a multicultural world with many people of many faiths, and we need help. And so I hope by learning how to evangelize, even just even giving the gospel in a right way, we, we see that even being perverted. Let's get back to witnessing. Let's get back to what we did at the beginning, how we loved Jesus with knowledge and zeal, and we wanted the world to know about him. Well, I hope that answers you this question, my dear friend, and I hope you've learned something about this. We have lots of materials we can help you with if you want to learn to be a more effective witness. So God bless in Jesus' name. For more information about Moriel, check out our website, www.moriel.org.